Every talkback broadcast features fascinating calls. Many produce impromptu teaching from Bob. His practical first-hand knowledge comes from more than 20 years of dealing with many puzzling and perplexing issues. Whenever Bob takes time out to teach, his listeners hear tough topics taught from the heart. The best of Bob's advice contains Bob's talk with Mandy, a feisty teenager about the rock group Cure. Every parent and teenager needs to listen to the resulting discussion. Listen to Mandy and Bob and how they deal with the issue of rock and roll. Mandy in Ohio. Hi, Mandy. Well, you made a comment that, well, the, the cure, well, you didn't say specifically the cure. Yeah. The gothic rock yeah. is well, making children or kids more morbid every day. Yeah. And I'd like to, like, how, what, how do you get that? Well, from all the lyrics I've been quoting to you, I've been quoting pretty morbid lyrics. Well, I'm only seeking it for the cure because I don't really know that much about the other group. Yeah? And I am prone more to pop music. Yeah? But the cure, I've, I I love them a lot. I mean, they're a good group. Yeah? So, I mean... What's good? What's good? Is this good? Mandy, a death nightmare of you of death in the pool wakes me up at a quarter to three. I'm lying on the floor the night before with a stranger lying next to me. This is like something that makes you feel good about life? Well, it's it doesn't make me feel good about life, but it doesn't make me feel good about death. I mean, it's... See, I don't, I don't understand what... Hey, I don't understand it either. Try this. I miss the kiss of treachery, the aching kiss, before I feed the stench of love for a younger meat and the sound that it makes when it cuts in deep. The that's holding soft up like disintegration, right? Yeah, that's off disintegration. You yeah. got it right. How old are you? I'm thirteen. Thirteen. Would you please tell me what it means when it says I miss the kiss of treachery, the aching kiss before I feed the stench of a love for a younger meat? He's missing his loved one. I mean, he's been without her and he misses her kiss. Well, no one says we have to go back to crooning a tune in the month of June under the moon. But could we possibly back off a little bit of feeding the stench of love for younger meat? <laughs> Come on, Mandy. I mean, Lawrence Welk, I'm not standing up for, but could we just somehow fall a little short of the younger meat? Yeah, that's off disintegration, man. <laughs> Mandy. You strike me as a very rude, rude Excuse man. Me. I'm rude. Yes. This guy's singing about the stench of younger meat, and you call me rude. Mr. Smith is very talented. Yeah. You're taking the words out of context. San Francisco, July 27, 1986. A fan climbed on stage and tried to stab himself in the chest, and the crowd went wild, thinking it was part of the show. That was a Cure concert. Two New, Zealand, two New Zealand boys committed suicide listening to The Cure. Just because two wacko people commit suicide while listening to Robert Smith and Simon and Lawrence and the rest of them does not mean that everybody is going to. All right, I agree with you. My mom has taken away my tapes. Yeah? She thinks that they're morbid. Mm-hmm. Aha, uh -huh, now we got it. Now we got it. No, I'm not being rebellious. <laughs> well, you're, no, but you're irritated at me because I represent... I re represent Big Brother in the Sky because your mother's taken no, away your listen, tape. No, I'm saved. I'm, I'm what? I'm a Christian school. You're saved? I'm a born-again Christian, and I believe that Christ is my Savior. Yeah? And that I was put on this earth to do His will, and that I should witness to other people. And listen to songs about the stench of love for younger meat. I'm not saying that. Well, you are saying that. I'm trying that. to stick up for the group. Well, I know you're sticking up. Yes. You're sticking up for the love of younger meat. Come on, come on now. Using one song. Well, I one used no, I used song. two songs. I used two songs. Two whole songs out of every single album, every twelve albums that they've made. Well, uh, listen, let's just <coughs> let's just deal with the two. I don't have all twelve here, okay? Now, come on, you tell me what is what what is hopeful. Would you please tell me? Yes. You know the song "The Blood." Um, I think I've heard it once. Paralyzed by the blood of Christ. Yes. Okay, I've heard it. What's it mean? Well, I I don't I can't read his mind. I don't know what he was thinking when he wrote it. Well, Mandy, you say that you're a Christian, right? Yes, sir, I am. 
how do you feel about the blood of Christ? If you were to describe the blood of Christ, what would you say to someone? What do you mean? Like, what it means to me? Wouldn't you say, like, I'm saved by the blood, blood of, of Christ? Jesus Christ, yes. Well, that's not what the man's saying. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying he's saved by the blood of Christ. They yeah, said, I know, I know. Robert Smith is Catholic. I mean, I, I know that. Not a very good one, he's not. Okay, well, maybe he's not a good Catholic. At least, at least he doesn't sound like a good Catholic. You said, you can tell a Gothic rock group by their white or black makeup. No. It was something to that effect. Well, I probably said you could tell goths by it. But 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 he does wear it on the album, The Disintegration. No, he doesn't. He's not? I'm he looking... Not, he is not wearing black eyeshadow. Uh, no, he, he's, he's wearing the white. He's got dark lipstick on. I'm looking at it right he now. He has blood red lipstick on, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's wearing white. I mean, he, he's, he's affecting part of the gothic style. But they're not a total gothic band, and I know that, and that isn't the point. You still, I picked a couple of songs here. I picked more than a couple of songs. I don't find anything hopeful in them. I don't find anything spiritual in them. In fact, I no, find a lot of... Put, if he wanted to be a Christian singer, he would have put him underneath Christian labels. Well, okay, so he's not a Christian singer. Right. Well, that doesn't make him a bad person. That just makes these songs bad songs. What, I don't, what is bad about them? Are you saying they promote death? I'm saying they provoke nihilism, negativism, and nothingism. Negative? How do you get negativism? Then you hear me comment about where, the, where, where Cure fans rioted in Brazil. They pelted the police with stones and glass and seats, concert hall seats. What now, does that have to do with them? They well, didn't well, let me tell, tell you. They didn't tell let me them, tell hey, me, you guys, go up there and no. riot the police and throw glass at but, them. But let me tell you something. I've watched the whole 75 minutes of the DeGarmo and Key rock-solid video, and I don't see them pelting the police with anything. I don't see them going wild and crazy in a rebellious fashion. What I'm suggesting to you is this. In the atmosphere created by the concert, in the leadership of the band, and in the remote message of the lyrics, there is negativism that leads to rebellion. You don't find it happening at a Garmo and Key concert. You don't see it happening at any, at a Carmen concert, at a Petra concert. And if you're a Christian, you know who these people are. What do you see at those concerts? You see people standing and cheering Jesus. You see them with their hands in the I air and one finger... I a Carmen lift... concert, so I well, know what you're talking about. Okay, so you compare a Cure and a Carmen concert with me and tell me the difference. What's the difference? Okay, well, at a Carmen concert mm -hmm. and other Christian singers, because I've been there too, people are rejoicing and, be, you know, just all around being glad. Rejoicing? About that they're, being, that they're saved and they're right. going to heaven and they're going to meet... Their maker someday. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I guess at a Cure concert, I guess they would... I, okay, the Cure to me, when I'm depressed and down and lonely, it's someone to relate to. Ah. When you're depressed, you don't want someone to... Sometimes you don't need that person to say, oh, everything's going to be all right, everything's going to be all right. Sometimes you need people to relate to it. And I have found that every time I listen to the Cure when I'm depressed, I'm not depressed anymore. You said the people at a Carmen concert are rejoicing. They're glad. Their focus is on the positive. It's on uplift. Okay? Mm -hmm. But you said when you're depressed and you feel lonely, you want something you can relate to. But what you're telling me you're relating to is the negative side of life rather than the positive side. The negative side is going to drag you deeper into the despair. If you'd relate to the positive side, it would lift you out of it. But when you're depressed, you don't want to hear about things like that. Of course you don't want to. The question isn't what you want to, it's what you should do. When you're sick and you go to the doctor and he wants to stick a needle in your rear, you don't really want him to do it, but he will allow him to do it because you know that the shot will make you well. And you take the medicine you need. Medicine is not good tasting stuff, but you take the medicine you need that heals you. You don't take more of the bacteria that puts you in that place in the beginning. Can you listen for a minute? Yeah, I am listening. I... Let mercy and truth not forsake you. Bind them about your neck. Write them on the tables of your heart. Now, what is the writer to the Proverbs saying? He's saying the things that you want to bind around your heart, the things, the things that you want written on your heart, the things you want bound around your neck, are not gloom and doom, are not despair and negativism. They are what? Your truth and mercy. The things that should be closest to your heart, the things associated with you, the things to which you are bound, 
should not be negative. They should be positive. They should be good things, godly things. Now, Mandy, what you are doing, and I'm not saying you're a bad girl for doing it, is very typical of human nature. I mean, you listen to people, you, you watch people who are despondent and blue, and they, we, we have the old phrase about crying in your beer. Well, like they, they, they do. They despond, they go drink, they go get drunk. Why? They want to cry in their beer. It doesn't help them any. It, in fact, it amplifies the despair. But there's a kind of sick, morose camaraderie and attraction to negativism when we feel negative. Now, the psalmist often felt negative. In fact, I was reading to someone yesterday. Well, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Do you feel that, as you called it, gothic rock, mm -hmm. which I looked the word gothic up, gothic mm -hmm. up and it means rude and barbaric, mm -hmm. and I do not feel that's describing the cure at all. Well, I think the cure is only remotely a gothic band. They have their roots in gothic, but they're not a gothic band like Christian death is, okay? Now, right. but you're not, the psalmist said, I am poor and needy. When you say you're depressed, you're poor and needy, right? Yeah. But what does the psalmist go on to say? Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. I will praise you with all my heart. I will glorify your name forevermore. For you are a God full of compassion, gracious, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. You see, as you read through all the Psalms, you find a counterbalance. One minute he's saying, I'm miserable, I feel awful, I feel like dying. But in the next minute he's crying out to God and he's praising God about the wonder and the beauty and the majesty of the Lord. Now, do you get the point? I think so. The point is that when we're depressed and when we're in need, instead of associating with things that amplify that depression, we should be doing what we don't want to do, what, it, what, what, what is negative, what is hard for us to do at that time, but that is reach out and praise God. But, but are you saying that, if, okay, if someone listens to The Cure, that they're going to become very morbid and... Yes, and that is exactly what I, I'm saying. I love The Cure, and every time they come on the radio, I turn it up, and I used to be able to listen to my tape freely. Mm -hmm. But I'm not anymore. Of course. I, I do not feel that it has affected me any. Well, I think that's... Because I'm not... A, I'm not... I think, Mandy, at 13, your mother is capable of making a far more intelligent decision about that than you are. And your mother's made the decision she feels in your best interest. And the scripture says, honor your parents in the Lord. And you're irritated with it because you love the cure. Well... Because they make beautiful music. Well, that's a matter of artistic opinion. But, I, but don't, I don't think... I don't think what I've quoted you is very beautiful. I think it's very negative and very sad. It is beautiful. Okay, well, okay. We disagree in our musical talents and tastes. But in a way, I don't think you have any right to say that... Well, I got it right because it's my it's, show and I pick the topic and I'm the one doing the talking. So that's what gives it to me. That's what gives me the right. Okay, you're right. Okay, so, I mean, that's the way it is. I mean, you're right about that. You go get your show and do your own thing. But, Mandy, before I go, I want you to listen to me. Yes. Once you get beyond the motion of your irritation of what your mother has done to you and what you feel is another heavy-handed reinforcement of this the... This isn't revenge, and that's what you're no, getting. No, no, no. Yes, you are. You're saying that... <laughs> I, yes, you are. Oh, you're a pistol, Mandy. I tell you what, you're a character. Yeah, I, but you're trying to say... I'm not sure if I I'm saw you right now if I'd want to turn you over my knee or give you a big hug. But... You're trying to say that I'm trying to get, like... I'm not trying to say you're trying to get rebellious. I'm saying you are rebellious. Oh, that. Then I'm trying to get back at my mom for taking away my tape. Well, you are. What kind of problems you got in your life? What is it that makes you depressed? I mean, that that's... Uh... Um, what does a 13-year-old girl get depressed about? Just about everything. Like? Like, school and, you know, sometimes you'd, like, have a little, you know, stupid argument about going somewhere mm -hmm. with your family, and it really kind of gets you down because... When you have a close relationship with someone and you argue about it, it, it really hurts. Who would you argue about? Just friends and things like that. Yeah? Places I, mean, I wanted to go. You mean you argue with your parents about it? Yeah. You wanted to go somewhere with somebody? Well, we just, it's like not a big thing. It's just this every once in a while we have little stupid arguments. And <laughs> they're the kind of arguments that like, oh, I'm sorry, I was in the wrong. It's over now. Forget about it. These are arguments with your parents. Yeah. Yeah. They still get you down for the time. They sure they do. I want to tell you something. Thirteen in our society is a very difficult age to go through. It's it's a tough age, and uh, 
the world's yanking at you from every direction, and uh, it's it's not easy to be a young woman in that kind of a time. And yeah, one can be awfully prone to depression. What else? Kind of silly things. Hey, Mandy. Yeah. If they get you depressed and they bother you, they're not silly. Don't treat them lightly. If they're important to you, they're important. Okay? All right. Okay. Um, Bob, I'm sorry for calling you rude. That's okay. I've been called worse. <laughs> but... But what? I'm starting to realize that... Okay, well, I started using the cure as a way out mm-hmm. over the summer because I mm-hmm. had a lot of problems this summer. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started to really like them. Mm-hmm. And I was first introduced to them because I had hardly heard them at all. But I, you guys at the station have helped me realize that, I mean, maybe I do like the music. Mm-hmm. And the words are morbid. Mm-hmm. And I started to realize that. Mm-hmm. And I shouldn't use them as a way out. You're right. And if you know Jesus, the way out in time of need is turning to him. Cast your care upon the Lord, for he cares for you, the scripture says. Come unto me, those of you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you know, Mandy, at 13 you do what a lot of us do at many times beyond 13. We, We don't always lay it at Jesus. We find other escapes. We're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it, too, a lot of the time. We all are. But what do I do now? I mean, well, well, I with, still like them, I mean. Sure, well, it's not wrong to like them. I mean, you've developed an affinity for them, and there's there's something about their music and their sound, and unfortunately there's even something about their appeal to the darker side of things that has fed into some of the, the personal pain you have in your life. So what you need to do is just, you know, leave that behind you and move on with your life now and say, okay, uh, these are some mistakes I've made, but, you know, the next time I start really feeling down, I'm going to turn to the Lord. I'm going to turn to Him. I feel kind of stupid now because it's like I called up here trying to make you realize that you were wrong. And I've been smacked in the face. <laughs> hey, I want to tell you something. That's just that's just the Lord loving you. And that's just the Lord wanting to, to reach out to you. Okay? Mm-hmm. Mandy? Yes. You there? Yeah. Okay. Crying? Yeah. It's okay. I wipe some tears from my eyes, too. It's okay. Life's tough at 13. Very difficult. There's a lot of stressful things you're trying to deal with. It's okay to cry, and it's okay to feel hurt inside about some of these things. It's okay. I just feel ashamed because I've put my mom... There were a lot because of my love for the cure. Ninety-five mm-hmm. percent of our arguments are stemmed from the cure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know. I mean, I don't know if this is true, but from my own observation, she stayed up at night and prayed for me. And it, she's just tried to help me, and I've been putting her down for it. Mm-hmm. And ever since I found the cure, we've been having more problems. Mm-hmm. And. We never had any problems before the cure. Hmm. And I just started realizing that. And I'd like to apologize to her. Because I really love her a lot and I never told her. Oh, you're a sweet kid. Now, Mandy, you just go tell your mom what you told me, okay? All right. But I want to tell you, what you said in the last two minutes was gutsy. It was courageous. It's what I wish all of us had the courage to say about things in our lives that come between us and the Lord and those we love. And I'm real proud of you, Mandy. And I tell you, with that type of uh, outlook and honesty and spiritual maturity, you're going to go a long way. Okay? Okay.